In 1967, exactly one year before his assassination, while standing in front of a crowd full of people at the Riverside Church in New York City, Martin Luther King Jr. uttered what is perhaps one of the most powerful, thought-provoking, and pronounced statements of all time. In the middle of what some have called his most controversial and oft-criticized sermons, King declares, there comes a time when silence is betrayal. And then in 1968, one day before his life was taken, King stood before another crowd in Memphis, Tennessee during that famous speech, I've been to the mountaintop, and with a cadence so consistent, he exclaimed to the crowd, but somewhere I read of the freedom of assembly. Somewhere I read of the freedom of speech. Somewhere I read of the freedom of press. Somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest for rights. And friends, when I put these two widely known sermons together in conversation, I don't just hear a political conversation about right versus wrong, nor do I only hear personal concern for the rights and liberties of all people. But in addition to those political and personal challenges to a nation steeped in too many isms to name, I also hear a push and a call to speak up, to refuse silence, and to shout until things change. And as I hear those words of Dr. King ringing loud in my ears and I realize the push and call to speak up, refuse silence, and shout till things change didn't begin in 1968 or even in 1967, I also hear in my spirit the voices of men, women, and children shouting and singing the words to that spiritual that took life sometime during the first half of the 19th century breathed into being by enslaved persons in search of freedom, declaring and deciding that Joshua fit the battle of Jericho and the walls come tumbling down deciding and declaring together that Joshua commanded the children to shout and the walls came tumbling down. And friends, what this says to me at the end of this year's Black History Month and in the middle of what has been a worldwide pandemic and nationwide epidemic and at the heart of what has been and will continue to be a fight for justice right here in the city of Rochester, where to be black and in distress somehow equaled a death sentence, but to be aware that a homicide has taken place can still lead to a lack of indictment towards those responsible, says to me that Martin Luther King Jr. spoke this in 1967, the enslaved sang it centuries ago, and it's still true today. There comes a time when silence is betrayal. And just like Joshua at the Battle of Jericho, we ought to listen for that command to shout till the walls come tumbling down. Yes, you've heard me correctly. While King stood before a full crowd of people and I stand here before empty seats, the challenge is just the same. This is a push and a call to speak up, to refuse silence and to shout until things change. Friends, the spiritual that we take seriously this week that spiritual within which we search for life and lessons that can be applied to this moment is a spiritual about speaking up, refusing silence and shouting till things change. It is a spiritual that reminds us that to be silent is to choose betrayal and it is a spiritual that requires of each of us listening and willing to learn to do something in this moment that will bring about change in the next. We are all being pushed and called to remember that reminder of Dr. King, which recalled that the greatness of America is the right to protest for rights. 
So instead of us hearing the acronym PUSH to only mean pray until something happens today, I want us to consider today what it means to protest until something happens, to shout until things change, to make up in our minds that just as silence is a form of betrayal, our decision to speak up is a form of protest. And like the enslaved from so long ago, our shouting and our singing as a collective can also be a form of righteous resistance. Joshua fit the battle of Jericho and the walls come tumbling down. Joshua commanded the children to shout and the walls come tumbling down. But friends, if I'm honest, I wrestled with this text this week. It's a complex passage of scripture that leaves you speechless. It's the kind of situation that causes you to sit in the tension of being grateful, yet even full of grief. It's a story about conquest in which one nation is promised the land of another, and in order to get to that promise, an entire nation has to be destroyed. It's a difficult story to sit with. But as I wrestled with the text this week, something kept shouting back at me from the pages of my Bible, or if I'm honest, from those lines on my phone screen. But on the one hand, it would appear that the act of marching around the Jericho walls multiple times over the course of several days is what caused the walls to fall. On the other hand, it would appear that their presence and the size of the army was perhaps so large that they conquered this battle with sheer intimidation. And if you read scholarly debates about this particular passage of scripture, it would even appear that there was some form of a natural disaster in the form of an earthquake that is actually responsible for the fall of the Jericho walls. But friends, regardless of their persistence, Regardless of the presence of their army and any other predicament that may have contributed to the collapse, the fact of the matter is the walls still came tumbling down. Which says to me in the middle of what looks like a hopeless and impossible situation that God's promises still remain. That even in the midst of whatever you or I are going through at this moment, that there is no wall, no boundary, no barrier too difficult, too demanding, and too discouraging for God. So if I could just pause here parenthetically and encourage somebody this morning, I want you to hear that when it comes to the God we serve, walls do come tumbling down. When you face seemingly impossible situations on the way to what God has promised you, you can rest assured that the same God who promised it is the same God who will see it to fruition. I know we don't talk much about miracles, signs, and wonders or about the kind of faith that can move mountains, but friends, after what has been a full year in a pandemic that has left many of us hurting, hopeless, and hesitant, I believe it's okay. It's okay to pause and take a moment to be reminded that God has not forgotten about us, that God still shows up even if it doesn't always happen the way we want it to, that the same God who did it for Joshua is the same God who is interested in doing it for us. We are a people of faith, aren't we? We are people who believe in what we cannot see and hope in what we cannot fathom, aren't we? Then that means we ought to believe in faith that God is still causing walls to fall right now in the year of 2021. If God could do it back then for Joshua and the Israelites, then friends, I'm crazy enough to believe that God can do it now. But here's the thing. The persistence and presence of the Israelites matters to the narrative of this biblical story because while I strongly believe that God is capable of moving all by God's self, I also believe that there are times throughout history and times in our own lives where God invites us to actively participate in the work being done. Here in Joshua chapter 6, that truth remains. <laughs> 
Joshua and the Israelites have to not only show up and make their presence known, but friends, they also have to remain persistent in their quest, deciding to keep showing up and to keep walking and marching until something happens. But then not only does the persistence and presence of Joshua and the Israelites invite them into the present and active work of God, but God then requires them to do something much like what Dr. King requires of us sometime later in the story. You see, Dr. King is not the only one to believe that there comes a time when silence is betrayal. Right here in the story of Joshua in the Battle of Jericho at about the seventh time, that is the seventh lap around the city on the seventh day, there is a sound issued. After marching in silence for six or so days, the trumpets began to blow. And Joshua, in obedience to the Lord's instructions, commands the people to shout. More specifically, the 20th verse tells us, as soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted a great shout and the wall fell down flat. Shout or shouted, which according to the Hebrew word rue means to raise a sound or to shout a war cry or alarm of battle is a sound similar to what persons all throughout history have issued to either encourage one's fellow teammates or to make people support an idea or a cause. Rue, my friends, is what is heard in the middle of this march. And as somebody who reads scripture and tries to picture in my mind what it is that's being described, I read about Joshua and the Battle of Jericho and a very familiar image comes to mind. I picture crowds of people of every background and persuasion. I picture the streets of Memphis, Tennessee of Washington, D.C., Baltimore, Maryland, Ferguson, Missouri, Montgomery, Alabama, Rochester, New York, and so many more filled with people walking up and down the street, around each corner, up to and around each building. And I picture people persistent in their walking, in their marching, in their determination to just keep going, chanting, singing, shouting, and screaming, reciting words aloud in that Rue spirit, no justice, no peace, no justice, no peace. Words that declare whose streets, our streets, whose streets, our streets. That Rue sound reminding us black lives matter, black lives matter. And then I hear those songs that declare in that same Rue spirit, go down Moses, let my people go. And then I hear steal away, steal away to Jesus. I haven't got long to stay here. And I even hear that song, the song we heard sung just a few moments ago in that same Rue spirit saying, Joshua fit the battle of Jericho. Jericho, Jericho, Joshua fit the battle of Jericho and the walls come tumbling down. Can you hear it? Can you hear the sounds of protesters all across this nation, all throughout our nation's history, using their unified voices to speak up, to refuse silence and to shout till things change? Friends, can you hear it? Can you hear the sounds of mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers friends? taking to the it? streets alongside? Can you hear the sounds of mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers world? taking to the streets when their own loved ones have already been killed? Can you hear it? Can you hear the sounds of our neighbors speaking up at press conferences, leading our city through town halls, pushing? for legislation and policy change that will make it a crime for you to claim to protect and serve when you really get to pick and choose who deserves your protection. Can you hear it? Friends, have we all become so consumed with our own lives and the fact that we have peace, that we can't be bothered to hear the cries of our neighbors? Have we distanced ourselves so much from what is happening right at the center of our own city 
that we've chosen silence and in turn betrayed our neighbors. Now I get it. Protesting doesn't feel like everyone's part in the fight. In fact, protesting has often gotten a bad rap and has been declared by some to be something that disturbs the peace and causes more harm than good. And while I want to take the opportunity right now to dispel the myth that protests are problematic, I also want to name that when you've been oppressed and beaten down for 400 plus years, no one gets the right to tell you how to respond. But more than that, what if I told you that there are different forms of protest? What if I told you that you don't ever have to show up to a rally in order to protest for what is right? What if I told you that you could protest right from the comfort of your home and that nobody has to know about it? What if I told you that your own rue or battle shout was in fact a form of protest? You see, all throughout this nation's history, people of every race and creed have been protesting for equal rights. Some have protested for their own rights, while others have recognized the disparities and have chosen to protest for the rights of others. Some of us can relate. Many of us have been involved in the fight for justice and have decided that our neighbors' lives matter too. And many of us have done it right at home with a phone call to city officials who refused to pass necessary legislation with a conversation with loved ones who refuse to see the humanity of others, with a letter to the police chief who won't hold officers accountable. Here's the thing. In order for you to speak up, to refuse silence, and to shout until things change, all you have to do is determine what makes your heart sing. All you have to do is figure out your own rue, that thing that makes you shout to think for a moment about one issue of injustice that keeps you up at night and then to, to, to decide to advocate for change. To do like Joshua and the Israelites and to decide what your battle cry will be and then to figure out how to shout it aloud until the walls come tumbling down. To decide like Joshua and the Israelites that you trust God so much that you're willing to push to pray and to protest until something happens, that you'll march for several laps around the same wall until it has no choice but to move until walls of poverty, racism, sexism, classism, homophobia, transphobia, xenophobia fall down flat until walls of greed, exclusion, pride, prejudice, housing, and health disparities fall down flat until the walls that we know exist, even if we do not name them right now, fall down and fall down flat. In other words, that you'll decide to keep calling city officials until they pass necessary legislation, that you'll keep engaging conversation with loved ones until they recognize their wrongs and decide to see the humanity of others, that you'll write a letter a week to the mayor, police chief, district attorney, and everybody else until the officers who killed Daniel Prude are actually held accountable, that you'll remember the songs of the enslaved. Those brave men, women, and children who had the courage to sing songs of resistance and protest, knowing that eventually things might change. Those courageous African-American men, women, and children who also chose to rue, to lift their voices and to shout until things changed, even when they knew it might not happen in their lifetime. Do you have that kind of courage? The kind of courage that says, if I never see the bill passed in my lifetime, I'll still speak up for what's right. Courage that says I might get in trouble for making some noise, but that listens to the words of the late John Lewis reminding us never to be afraid to make some noise and get in good trouble. Courage that takes seriously the words of Holocaust survivor Elie Wiesel when he says there may be times when we are powerless to prevent injustice, but there must never be a time when we fail to protest. And friends, I promise you, I get it. It is easy to become weary in well-doing. 
It is easy to become so overwhelmed with grief by poor government decision after poor government decision that you start to wonder what's the point in fighting. It's easy to become so frustrated by the centuries-long attack on black and brown bodies that you just rather leave the battle to somebody else. But friends, first and foremost, if you are a person of privilege, this is not the fight where you get to be tired. And second, as people who happen to be on the other side of slavery in its original form, we all have an obligation to the men, women, and children who sang and shouted their way to freedom to continue the fight for justice. We have an obligation to those that came before us down and through the civil rights movement and Jim Crow, those black and white men and women in our nation's history whose shoulders we stand on. And we have an obligation to hold tight to those words I once read, which say protests sometimes look like failures in the short term, but much of the power of protesting is in their long-term effects. Just think about where we were and where we are now. There's power in long-term effects. Think about the laws that have changed and the policies that no longer hold weight. Power is in the long-term effects and think about the change that we have seen. And then fix your eyes on what can still take place. Push, yes, pray until something happens, but protest until something happens too. And if prayer is your form of protest, please don't stop praying. Listen and learn from the enslaved persons of the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries who were a people who never stopped singing, never stopped marching, never stopped fighting for their freedom and for mine. Listen and learn from the spiritual stamina of a people who have been oppressed longer than they've been liberated and yet who never stopped shouting until something happens. Listen and learn, my friends, from the spirituals and songs which tell us how to use our voices to advocate for change and how to refuse silence even when choosing to speak might cost you. But I want to be clear. I want you to listen and learn, but I want you to do so while saying and doing something. I want you to consider this month everything that you've heard us talk about week after week after week. Consider that home over Jordan, that desire to cross over into campground, that determination to cross deep rivers and make it to the other side. Consider that balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole. Consider that balm in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. Consider waiting in the water, that desire to step out into unknown territory and the faith that God will trouble the water. Consider the walls of Jericho, that desire to march and to shout until the walls literally come tumbling down. And remember, friends, that in all of those spirituals and in all of the singing, African Americans throughout history have taught us what singing and shouting and using our voices can do. Let me say this, it will be a disappointment for us to have sang these songs and learned these lessons just to leave them here in February of 2021. Perhaps what we can do instead is to make a commitment together to join the chorus of voices down and throughout our nation's troubling, yet in some ways triumphant history, and shout until the walls come tumbling down. Maybe we can do it by learning to love just a little harder, loving our neighbors so much that we refuse to stay silent when our speaking might free someone else, by loving our city so much that we refuse to let injustice prevail, by truly believing and understanding Dr. Cornell West's words when he tells us that justice is what love looks like in public. Friends, if that's what it means to love, may we heed the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and remember that while every person of humane convictions must decide on the protest that best suits their convictions, we must all protest. <laughs>
And in so doing, may we speak up, refuse silence, and rue or shout till those walls around us come tumbling down. Because friends, for so long as there are walls of injustice in this world, each of our voices can still make a difference. May it be so. Amen.